can please turn in your Bibles to John 10.10. 10. John 10.10. 10. We're in a series called The Gospel According to Randy. And this does not mean to supplant the Gospel of Christ. Randy's just my father-in-law. And uh, he's a Christian. And he was uh, came up with four ways of living so that he could faithfully live out the Christian life. So I just call it The Gospel According to Randy. Uh, he's a concrete guy, so he needed a list. And basically, this is Bible wisdom from the godliest man that I know. And he said something years ago when I was asking him about this. And I thought it was brilliant. I wanted to share it with you. I was sort of praising him because I was seeing in his life how he lived these things. And I thought he was like super Christian or something. And he said this. He said, my practice of these four ways of living is a practice. He says, I do this not because I'm strong but because I'm weak. And when he shared these things with me, I found them very helpful, and I hope you find them helpful as well. First one is, every day is a good day. We looked at that one a couple of weeks ago. Uh, God does not make bad days. That is not an optimistic slogan. That is a statement about the Bible truth of the goodness of all creation, including time. God created time. Not many people think about that. God exists beyond time. And when he created time, it was very good, first day, second day, third day, and so forth. He doesn't make bad days. Bad things happen. Absolutely no one can disagree with that. But he intended that day for good. Now the second one is uh, life is a series of adjustments. And we talked about that last Sunday. A lot of adjustments are happy. Uh, sometimes you get a new job, or you get married, or you have a child, or something like that. But sometimes things are not happy that require adjustment. You have unemployment or miscarriage or abandonment or abuse of some kind. How does the Christian handle that? The Christian handles that and copes with that by holding on to God's promises. And the big promise that we talked about last week was Jesus saying, Behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's Matthew 28, 20. He never promised us that things would not be difficult or that hills wouldn't be hard to climb or anything like that. But what he promised was is that he would go with us through the fire as the old gospel song declares. Now the third thing is this. The third way of living is live until you die. So this is where John 10.10 10 comes in. So let's look at this. The thief comes only to kill and destroy. This is Jesus speaking. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the Word of God for the people of God and all God's people. Basically, what this Scripture means is that Jesus came to help us live until we die. And then after that, there is eternal life. We're going to focus on living in this side of eternity today. And I'm not talking about um, the quantity of life here. We're talking about the quality of life. This is live until you die. And this is not some kind of hedonistic, humanist battle cry. Okay? This is something that is meant with Christian intention. How does the Christian live until they die? And Jesus talks about it. He talks about living abundantly. Folks, I don't know if you get this or not, but every single thing begins with Jesus. Think for a moment about what Jesus said. Anybody who hears those words must know that the real Christian life is never boring. The real Christian life lived properly is a wild ride. You are not saved. We are not saved to please ourselves or to wallow in what we are comfortable with. We are saved for the Lord. Now, you are, think about it this way. This is you know, Memorial Day and there's a military dimension to this celebration today. Think about it this way. You are a member of a strike force. No, I'm not kidding. You are a member of a strike force for good in the world. Have you ever thought of that? You are part of a strike force for the kingdom of God waging war against the kingdom of Satan. Except we don't jump out of airplanes and we don't use scuba gear and we don't sneak up on the enemy. We wage something else. We wage love, folks. We wage love on sea, land, and air, and give us a minute, we'll do it in space, because this dadgummit is Madison County. 
We bless folks in Jesus' name with prayer, with service, with material things like food for Sukula, and with the power that God has gifted us with. This is one good reason, my friends, to pray in the power of God's Spirit every single day and call on His Spirit every day and pray, pray, pray for more spiritual gifts that He can give you because there's stuff out there that needs to be done and it's not getting done. And we also share the good news about Jesus with the people that we encounter. Now, what are some examples? Have you ever thought that on a Sunday morning, you could maybe drive somebody to church that may not be able to get there for one reason or another. Have you ever thought about adopting part of our roads here in Madison and helping to keep them clean? I'd love to see those orange Madison church shirts out there cleaning stuff up sometimes. Sometimes people throw stuff out and I go running out on Hughes sometimes. And it's hard because I'm 45 and I'm weak and I go up those hills but it's there. And I see trash all up and down the side of the road. In Madison, for crying out loud, this isn't, you know, we're not like Bessemer or something like that. We're Madison. No offense to Bessemer. But there's a lot of things to do. But you could hold a Bible study in your house for people in your neighborhood who feel weird about coming to church. There's lots of stuff to do. Now, where does the strength come to do all that? Where does the strength come for living like that? It cannot and shall not come from your own strength. You could do that. You could do it for a while. But you will burn out. So where does the power come from to see the race to its end, to live until you die, so to speak? It comes from the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to tell you, look, you can come up to every altar. And you can wail and you can cry all you want to. You can get dunked in every baptistry in the county every single day until the day you die. But unless you call on the power of God and you listen to His promises and He will answer that promise when you call on His power, you will not make it through even your own struggles, let alone lock arms with other Christians and send the enemy back to his little rat hole, okay? There is no holy retirement in this life. There is no holy retirement in this life. The trouble with too many Christians who were about my age and older think that somehow that there is some kind of holy retirement plan. And for some reason, uh, after the youngest child graduates high school or something like that, the sin of sloth starts jumping in on people's lives, starts creeping in, and the enemy mutters, you know, you've done enough for the kingdom of God. It's time for you to take it easy. There's not a whole lot of lies that the devil sells better than that one, and it's a great one. Even if you are blind and can't walk, there is something for you to do. If you can't do anything else, you pray. You pray in the power of the Spirit. You pray for this church. You pray that the Spirit would fill this place and fill the heart of every person who comes here. Who, and pray that the stranger who comes here can just tell that there's something different about this place because God is here. And it may take 40 years of praying before some kind of revival breaks out. It may take four years of praying for 40 seconds of glory. But He promised and He can and He will. And another thing, hold on a minute. There's too many Christians that are my age and younger who think that they can ride the gravy train of the kingdom of God without commitment and without sacrifice and without giving their all just as the Lord gave His all on the cross. Now King David said something that a lot of people miss because they don't think that they should study the Old Testament. This is in 2 Samuel 24, 24. King David said this, I will not sacrifice to the Lord the burnt offerings that cost me nothing. I will not sacrifice to the Lord the burnt offerings that cost me nothing. A lot of people, a lot of preachers bring that out when they're trying to talk about giving money. Not a lot of them bring it up when they're talking about giving our lives. There is no victory without sacrifice. And the cross proved that. Now look, Generation X and Gen Y and the Millennials and all that had heard all their lives 
we've heard all of our lives that they are not interested in commitment and I submit to you today that that is absolute unadulterated horseradish. We just haven't found a lot of causes that are worth fighting for. And when we do find something, we hold on strong. We lock our jaws on it and you gotta get a crowbar out to let us make it, let, you know what I'm saying, to let it go. There is nothing worth more of total commitment than following Jesus Christ. So folks, follow Him. And if you're not, it's never too late and it's never too early. This is a good word for you today. I want you to listen to this. I want you to find, go in your Bibles and find a promise of God and dare to believe in it. I want you to get in your Bibles and study your Bibles. Find a promise of God and dare to believe in it. Live until you die. But how should we live? King David also said this, Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Live now for Christ. Do not put this off. Don't wait for the right bishop. Because that's more of a preacher thing. I mean, I, we got people who ordain people who are just waiting on the right bishop. I'm like, my God. <laughs> deliver us from this pagan nonsense. And then there's other people in church because they just wait on the right preacher. Which is bang right. <laughs> Jesus show up, they still be waiting on the right preacher. Don't wait for all the people in the church to get saved. Don't wait for all the people in the church to be unapathetic with this, to that, and all that nonsense. Don't wait for perfection around you. You run after perfection yourself. You go and you live until you die. You hunger and thirst after righteousness yourself. Why? Because if you catch that hunger, the Lord will fill it. He promised He would. He will give you all that He can, which is everything. And He will give you more than you can eat. This is more potluck than the church's potluck that you've ever seen in the history of potlucks. There will be no end to what He will fill you with. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. They won't get a dab. They won't get a smidgen. They won't, you know, somebody won't just fix them a plate. You will have the whole potluck buffet laid out there for an infinite distance. Everything will be laid out. Everyone shall be filled who hungers and thirsts after righteousness. This is a promise of God. Dare to believe in this and live until you die. Live abundantly and live now for Jesus Christ. Live as if nobody else was watching. Live as if only He were watching. Live as if He was cheering. I'm going to tell you a story about a man named Stephen Lungu. Stephen Lungu was the oldest son of a teenage mom in a township in Zimbabwe. And his mom was trapped in a really difficult marriage to a man uh, from, who was more than 20 years older than her. And she dealt with her struggles every day by drinking. And one day Stephen was almost four years old and his mom takes him and the baby brother and the baby sister down into town and Stephen's mom says okay wait right here because I've got to go to the bathroom and two hours later they were still standing right there mom had not returned because mom had run away and by some stroke of luck uh, one of their aunts agreed to raise them but by the age of 11 Stephen had run away himself he had preferred life on the streets and he had also developed quite a strong bitterness against God. And as a teenager, he got into a gang called the Black Shadows. They carried out a lot of violence, theft, destruction. And one day, a traveling evangelist came to town to speak. He was speaking about Jesus. He had set up a large tent, and Stephen and his gang members decided they were going to firebomb the revival. And they brought in a whole bag of homemade bombs. And he wanted to attack the event because he wanted to attack God. And as Stephen waited for the moment of the attack, there was a South African evangelist who was there. His name was Shadrach Moloka. 
And he stood up and he announced that the Holy Spirit had warned him that many in the audience would die soon without Christ. And this freaked out the gang members because they thought that their plan had been figured out. And so they had to stay there because if they left, they figured they'd be arrested. And then they started hearing the preaching. And they didn't set off their bombs. And Stephen was captivated by Jesus. And the speaker's words convinced him that he was a sinner. And right there, Stephen met Christ. He was filled with the Spirit. And he experienced God's love in his heart. He staggered forward to the stage. He grabbed hold of the speaker's feet and started to cry. And right there, he became a follower of Christ. The next morning, he went to the police office. He, can, he had a list. And he confessed all the crimes that he had committed since he was 11 years old. And the desk sergeant looked at the list. And he listened to his story. And then took one more look at him and let him go. In those hours, Stephen died. And he was raised to new life. A new, abundant life to be lived until he died. He got on the bus. He was so happy because he didn't have to go to jail. <laughs> so he started telling everybody about Jesus. And he himself became an evangelist, speaking at many revivals around Africa. A few years ago, there was an elderly lady that came forward at one of the revivals he was holding. And he thought he recognized her. Can you guess who it was? It was his mom. And she gave her life to Christ there too. See, when you live until you die, you don't know who else is going to be raised from the dead along the way. Now you may say, you know, I'm older. I don't have much time left. On the cover of your bulletin is a man named Fauja Singh. He has an interesting story. When he was almost 90, he said he was feeling, quote, more dead than alive. He had just lost his wife of 65 years. He had also just lost a son. And he wanted to do something. He wanted to feel life pumping in his veins again. And so he did what any almost 90-year-old man would do. He started training for marathons. <laughs> at age 92, in the year 2003, he finished the London Marathon in six hours and two minutes. On October 16, 2011, he became the first known 100-year-old man to finish a marathon in Toronto. His time was 11 hours, excuse me, 8 hours, 11 minutes, and 6 seconds. He helped carry the Olympic torch in the London Olympics in July of 2012. He retired, <laughs> retired from the running circuit after 13 years in 2013. He still runs at age 100 and 107 for pleasure, health, and to raise money for charities. When asked how he feels running a marathon, he said this, the first 20 miles are not difficult. <laughs> It still cracks me up. <laughs> yeah, you heard the funny part of it. But as for the last six miles, I run while talking to God. <laughs> he also said this, when I, looked, when I took up running, it was like meeting God himself. And I have been running ever since. Live, my friends, until you die. And some of you may say, well, I got time left. And I remind you, and I've mentioned this two or three times already, but there are millions of young men and young women who said that, but whose lives were cut short by war. And today we remember them. Sometimes, you know, we might look at that old black and white picture that's not really black and white anymore, it's sort of black and brown, about that relative that we don't quite know the story of. And we look at them and they're young in that picture. And we think about how they ran out of time. Nearly every cross at Normandy and every poppy that rises out of the fields in Flanders represents a young someone that thought that there were many days to come. And honestly, maybe there are. Statistically, yes, probably, but you never know. Because folks, even when you're young, especially if you're, if you're young, live until you die. You wear out, you don't rust out. And live not for yourself, 
but live for Jesus Christ. Growing old, as we say these days, is a privilege that has been denied to far too many. Don't forget that. And don't forget those who died. Don't forget those voices that we remember this weekend. Now, every single one of us needs a way of living, a practice that comes from the Bible that can help us triumph over the things that we think hold us down. A tragedy can be as much of an end as you want it to be. So you live until you die. And let me be real honest here. The Lord does not need you. I know that may sound strange. He does not need you. He does not need me. But He sure does want us. So we hunger for Him and He will take up whatever we offer in life and do with it more than we have imagined. It will be a life more fulfilling than we ever mentioned. Sometimes we think that giving up, uh, following Jesus means giving up our dreams. Let me tell you something. Your dreams may be wonderful, okay? But the dreams of God are always better. And your heart may be heavy and you may not uh, be in a position right now spiritually or emotionally to even dream a dream. Well, then you ask God for His dreams. They will be better than any of the dreams that you could possibly come up with, even on your best day. Because those dreams, His dreams, will make the most difference in the world. And because He is the one who actually has the power to make those dreams come true. And you may think that surrendering your dreams will break your heart, but it's the people who have broken hearts that God finds the most useful, the most deployable. Not deplorable, but deployable. Military town, y'all know what I mean. People who have their own dreams, sometimes those dreams get in the way of hearing God's voice. But if your heart is so low that you are completely dreamless, then you are one that God can use. You are the one who is truly ready to follow Jesus and live until you die. So my friends, go forth and do that in the name of Jesus. If you haven't given your life to Christ, you can come forward at the altar time. But, <coughs> folks, don't let your time now pass by however much or little you think you have. Live until you die.